the effort to determine the degree and quality of mental activity in human beings and in animals has progressed scientifically since the last decade of the 19th century when the concept of intelligence testing and aptitude testing uh, came under the general uh, interest and heading of psychological research. We must recognize, however, that this is merely a specialization existing in a situation that has concerned people for a very long time. And the roots of our intelligence testing are to be found in the more ancient systems of human association, observation, and experimentation. From the very most remote time, it was essential to human beings to gain some insight into the characters of each other. It was not a matter of attempting some unfair or unreasonable advantage. But primitive man needed to know uh, the reliability, the integrity, the courage, and the devotion of the members of his tribe. The tribe in turn seeking to select some leaders, chiefs, or representatives, had to test in some way the suitability of the persons who were to represent them. The tribal process was largely one of association. The small community life brought persons into continuing intimacy with each other. So the elders gathering to decide the suitability of some candidate spoke from their own personal knowledge. They had lived with the candidate. They had observed him since childhood. They knew his character and his ways. And they could ponder his suitability for the task which they were considering. This was a long method, however, this association uh, procedure. It meant a simple statement that the only way to know a person is to live with them. We still recognize this as basically true. But we know that in the confused civilization in which we live, it is difficult, if not impossible, to estimate character through lifelong association. We may be able to do so in a few personal instances, but not upon a scale large enough to meet the requirements of industry, management, and things of that nature. We also realize that primitive man, particularly during the rise of his religious systems, instituted what were called mysteries. These mysteries impose tests or trials to determine the moral character, the intellectual penetration and the physical stamina of candidates seeking advancement in science, religion, or philosophy. Various trials and difficult situations were created, and every effort was made to note thoroughly and carefully the inevitable instinctive reflexes of the candidate to these artificial situations that came upon him suddenly 
and which required clarity of immediate decision. Perhaps in some of these situations we have the beginning of the concept of the lie detector, the polygraph, some instrument or procedure whereby the spontaneous reaction of the person could be measured or at least observed. Gradually these procedures passed into other departments until we came to the first formal effort to determine the life of another individual in a practical, useful manner. This we generally termed the interview. This was the most primary form of a scientific approach to character estimation. The interview can take several forms or be for several reasons. Two of the most common causes for an interview are employment and medical guidance. The person uh, seeking to employ will sit down with the prospective employee and attempt to determine his fitness for the task or the opportunity available. This procedure depends upon several factors which are highly fallible. First of all, the employer must either be highly intuitive or exceptionally skillful in directing the interview. He must either have so wide an acquaintance with persons uh, with uh, this procedure that he inevitably and instinctively uh, approaches it in a reasonable and proper manner. The employee or candidate for employment may also have considerable ability at subterfuge. He can conceal weak points. He can exaggerate his abilities. He can affirm qualities which he does not fully possess. Or, having passed through such interviews before, he is in a position to judge what answers will be most likely to advance his cause. Thus he speaks not from his true nature, but from the pressure of a desire to secure this particular employment. Even if he be a, an honest person, basically, he must be forgiven if he becomes defensive and uses his natural psychological instincts to protect the weaknesses of his own character. He can even do this without conscious knowledge. Therefore, the interview, as the basis of character decision or determination, is subject to so many possible variations uh, that it is now generally uh, regarded as ineffective by itself. And the present tendency is to go back to the old guild methodology used in ancient times. And that is if the preliminary interview appears to be satisfactory, then to employ the person on a probationary basis or simply tell him frankly that it is up to him to prove his usefulness to the firm, business, or organization. Usually this is accompanied by a sliding salary scale, and the uh, candidate for employment is assured that if he proves valuable, he will receive additional remuneration. He is then observed rather closely 
for a period of six months or a year, then his natural aptitudes are re-estimated. Thus we go back to the association procedure as the final test or proof of the interview. The interview, therefore, is not solutional, but acts as a kind of screening. And we know from experience that while in most cases this screening is helpful, in many instances, uh, unwise questioning has screened out individuals who in another uh, test at some other uh, place of employment have succeeded admirably and become valuable employees. So this test has so many human equation factors that it is not now regarded as overly satisfactory on an industrial or economic level. The advantage of screening or the interview in connection with medicine is somewhat greater, although also subject to fallibility, as the physician is dealing mostly with physical problems, and the patient must, in the hope of recovery, be rather factual, and as these problems usually do not reflect adversely upon the character of the patient, the, uh, the answers are most likely to be honest, but can be erroneous. Of course, where the medical interview is in terms of an, of an insurance policy, the candidate can also be a wholesale liar. All of these situations cause the interview, which at one time was held to be rather important, to be regarded largely as introductory today. And uh, personnel departments usually select someone uh, as a, uh, an interviewer who has deep human experience and is able to proceed rather by intuitive judgment uh, than by any formal system of questioning. Often an astute uh, interviewer can get a great many facts, often without the actual knowledge of the candidate. But interviews, for one reason or another, have always been popular, and a great many judgments in life have been based upon personality which has favorably impressed an employer or someone who is in charge of the interview. The second type of testing represents also an old form, uh, which has descended to us with its strengths and its weaknesses. And to this we generally give the term the examination. We know the examination today principally in connection with education. The, ed the examination is a comprehensive series of tests indicating the attainment of the individual in the subject or area of penetration to which the test belongs. Examinations usually accompany the completion of terms or semesters or periods of study, although they can also accompany other things. For instance, today we take an examination in order to get a license to drive an automobile. Now, as we observe the number of persons examined in automobile driving and the constantly increasing number of accidents, we realize that persons not actually sufficiently coordinated to drive an automobile safely can pass the examination. Now this gives us a key to the fallacy of the whole theory of examination. <clears throat> Most
most examinations that we give today are in terms of memory. It is not intuitive or instinctive mentation, but the remembering of sequences of events, of processes, of procedures, of technical methods, these ensure a satisfactory examination, but for the most part give us little if any concept of the actual degree of mental activity of the person taking the examination. Examinations also depend upon words in most cases, either spoken or written. And words as obscurers of ideas, words as patent statements, which can be applied to questions in the forms of answers without actually touching the mental creativity of the person. Uh, such formulas, such procedures, do not give us any adequate concept of the degree of intellection that is present. We are much better off on this type of testing with the animal world, where certain intelligence tests can also be applied. The animal not being able to speak must act out the answer, or must answer by following impulses, instincts within its own nature, over which perhaps it has no conscious control. Therefore, in this case, the pure mental level or mentation of the creature uh, is available without subterfuge, misrepresentation, or evasion. These factors always being present uh, where words or uh, skills in craft can be brought to bear upon the subject. Another important uh, defect in the examination comes from a consideration of the physical circumstance of testing. At the present time, nearly all examinations are given with a pressure over the head of the candidate. Nearly always, of course, mental testing is for a purpose. But where that purpose directly affects the immediate future of the individual, we observe a distinct irregularity in respiration. We observe a tendency to tacticardia or the uh, rapid heart pulse. We also observe a tendency to rapid fatigue, perspiration, exhaustion, fear, worry, anxiety mechanisms, and not infrequently at the critical moment a mental blackout. The person is simply too frightened uh, to give the examination uh, its proper degree of personal relaxation. Young people today taking examinations uh, in educational institutions go so far as to take sedations and hypnotic drugs in an effort to prevent this tension procedure. But wherever an examination of available knowledge is given under extraordinary tension, we must recognize that this can, in some cases, result in a completely false uh, result, a result which does not give us that which is desired, namely a true insight into the ability of the student. The students who have 
no such immediate tension problems, and there can be such. There are some persons born to worry, and others who never seem to be able to even cultivate the habit. But the sensitive, conscientious person, who might therefore become an outstanding example of some attainment, is the one most likely to be detrimentally affected. So the examination, even in school, in which graduation depends upon it, an examination in which some immediate good is endangered if the candidate fails, an examination in which while he is taking the test, he is dominated by a consideration other than the test. While he is working with the problem, he is also nursing anxiety. These divisions of energy are detrimental. And there has been recently a motion which is expected to gain momentum by means of which grading in universities and graduate schools will be more and more upon a comprehensive estimation of total work and less and less upon examinations. In many of our higher institutions today, the student either graduates or fails his course almost completely upon the final examination. If this examination is exceptionally good, it will raise low levels of previous grading, perhaps to an acceptable degree. But even if his grades are consistently fair, if he does not do well on the final examination, he will fail the course. This puts too much pressure on the examination. It causes the person not to be in the condition to call upon creativity. It locks his nervous system and impairs his memory, which is so important in most of these kinds of tests. So the examination is, generally speaking, only indicative of certain things. The examination may have uses under certain conditions, but as a determinant of intellectual ability, of mental activity as mental activity, it is not adequate. This brings us to the third department of our subject, namely the development of essentially psychological means of testing. Psychology is a comparatively young field, and being dedicated almost exclusively to the consideration of mental phenomena, it is quite natural and reasonable that psychologists should attempt to determine certain values, and seek for instruments for the examination of mental levels. So one of the first questions that arises is, what is mental activity? Actually, mental activity is the directing power leading to action. Mental activity is the leader or guide or director of some form of physical activity, or else it manifests through the sensory perceptions into fields of objective creativity, as in art, music, and literature. It is the degree of ability of the mind to function as applied to the needs of individuals in various fields of activity personally. 
How then shall we determine the ability of a mind to function? We know that all minds function in some way, even the subnormal mind or the moron has some kind or degree of mental function, may be highly limited or impaired or retarded, but it is still there. We know also that most of the higher primates have considerable mental function, and it is possible to determine the ingenuity, the originality, the creativity of animals. So in determining this problem, the question was, what is a normal degree of mentality? Theoretically, a normal degree of mentality is that by which the individual is adjusted to his, to his environment and is capable of performing such actions as may be reasonably expected of him within the pattern of his abilities and environment. This is a very broad statement, however, and we soon get into difficulties. One of the problems, of course, that psychology has been battling since its beginning has been its search, its desperate seeking of what might be termed the normal mind. The normal mind, like the normal body or the normal complexion or the normal way of doing things, is elusive. What we commonly term the norm is almost totally relative. We search, therefore, to discover what is the normal conduct of the individual by observing, testing, or recording and classifying the conducts of a certain number of persons. We observe that if we can check by some means a million persons that the common levels of these persons will constitute norms. And to these norms as measurements we will apply the attainments of other persons. In our thinking, man has apparently two age patterns. One is his chronological age pattern. That is, he is 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, according to chronology. This chronology is man's measurement of time, based largely upon the mutations of the heavenly bodies, the day by the motion of the sun, uh, the year uh, by the motion of the seasons, and things of that nature. Now, chronological age tells us only how long the person has been in this world. And it also tells us uh, that according to the length of time he is here, certain knowledge, certain attainment may be expected of him. We know also that the degrees of attainment are not subject merely to his existence here. They are subject also to physiological and psychological processes taking place within him. Therefore, he passes through childhood, into adolescence, finally into young maturity. And each of these epochs within his own life has its own particular meaning for him and has an effect upon his emotional and mental patterns of living. 
Also it is assumed with some uh, validity that the, the biological factor of heredity may have something to do with this growth process. That even more the early pressures of environment may have an influence. And in philosophy we suspect that the concept of rebirth also plays an important part. All of these factors lead to the inevitable conclusion that mental, emotional, or psychological growth is not always exactly consistent with chronological physical growth. Thus the problem is to determine if humanly conceivable and possible just exactly what kind of a mind there should be in a ten-year-old body. Theoretically, the answer is so wonderful that almost any student could pass the test without thinking twice. But the answer means nothing. Answer being, of course, that in a ten-year-old body, normalcy would require a ten-year-old mind. This is pretty, uh, pretty obvious. But who knows what a ten-year-old mind is, or what it is? And who knows how to recognize it? And how shall we determine it? Theoretically, a ten-year-old mind should be more advanced than a nine-year-old mind and less advanced than an eleven-year-old mind. But as we do not know the advancements or limitations of the nine- and eleven-year-old minds, we are still in a difficulty. To meet this difficulty, we must fall into one of the bad habits of our times, and that is try to judge individuals in terms of groups, or try to determine what the individual is in reference to other individuals rather than in reference to himself. Therefore, a broad survey can be made in search of the adjusted ten-year-old child and his attainments, his, his class and school records, his known characteristics, his reflexes and reactions under stress and test can also be made. He can be placed in front of blocks which he can pattern and arrange. He can be required to recognize objects. He can be required to uh, perform certain mental tasks. He can be asked questions that require imagination or judgment. And by degrees, his level can be distinguished. But let us realize that no matter which child we question, we are only discovering the level of that child. We are not discovering the thing we're looking for, the norm. Then we go out and we examine 50 children, 500 children, 10,000 children. And by such procedure, we believe firmly that we are reducing the margin of error. True, we will never be able to examine all children. Therefore, we can never have the satisfaction of that total all answer. <clears throat> then we say to ourselves, well, this isn't necessary because all children do not live under the same culture patterns. Therefore, it would not be particularly useful for us to compare uh, the advancement of the Digger Indian child, or perhaps the Hottentot, with the highly trained Western school child. We would not expect to find the same 
degrees of response. But here's the rub. It depends on what we're looking for. If we're looking for scholastic ability, yes. If we are looking for the memory of facts made available by schooling, yes. But if we put these two children side by side in the wilderness and the problem is survival, then we have to approach this whole problem on a different level. The Hottentot might be the one to come through. Now, theoretically, all instruction is to advance the probability of survival. But the kind of instruction that we receive factually places us under continuously greater dependence on each other. So that today, when you ask a question of the child, how do I get water? We no longer get the answer that you go to a certain probable place in the desert and start spading for it. You get the answer today, turn on the faucet. This does not mean, however, the same degree of intellectual thoughtfulness. Thus, by the pressure of our way of life, the need of the mind for original and immediate solution to problem is being continuously reduced. Thus we have no longer the primary problem of survival in the practical sense of the word. We have rather today uh, normalcy in the term of adjustment to the existing way of doing things. And as adjustment in most cases, is being made progressively easier. And adjustment, for the most part, does not require originality of mental activity. We find that certain parts of man's intellectual life are dying of starvation and are also neglected to the degree that these neglected areas may detract from his peace of mind, from his happiness, from his ability to enjoy these luxuries with which he has surrounded himself. So the question still remains, where is the normal ten-year-old mind? What is it? Maybe a hundred years ago, the normal ten-year-old mind was already well on the way to a craft or trade. Because of the apprenticeship theory, and because it was customary for children to follow in the footsteps of their parents, the ten-year-old son of the cobbler could already probably make a pair of shoes. Today, we do not have this kind of thinking for the most part. Always there are exceptions to broad statements. But today, the average child of 16 is not certain of a future. He has yet the decision to make. He must decide at 16 or 18 what he is going to do with his life. It's possible in an individual case that this is rather clearly pressed upon him. But in many instances it is not. And in universities where young people are uh, enrolling for higher education, it is frequently the uh, counselor or some person appointed to assist and direct education who is responsible for deciding what kind of a career or profession a student is going to follow. He is asking for help rather than telling what he 
wants to do. Now here, of course, your so-called aptitude tests uh, come in to a considerable degree of utility. And it is becoming more and more possible to determine in general what the available aptitudes of the person may be. But your aptitude test is also full of holes because it depends very largely upon the individual's ability uh, to clearly express or define or reveal his acquired mental attainments. His intrinsic mental ability is difficult to test because it can be known only, apparently, through its functions. And its functions have been already, in most instances, conditioned by from four to eight years of specialized schooling. Consequently, instead of finding what the person really is, we find out what education, heredity, and environment have made out of that person as he is. Though we can say this doesn't mean much in term bread and butter, that actually whatever has happened to him and however it has happened, his immediate problem is to capitalize on an accumulation of liabilities and come out with some progressive or positive consequence. Actually, most testing today, particularly in the aptitude field, is for helping us to capitalize these liabilities, helping us to adjust with a minimum of originality uh, to whatever acquired abilities are strong enough to supply us with employment. <clears throat> this frequently results in, not in the int intended uh, end, but in a contrary one. The person entering into the employment for which he is adequately and admirably suited, according to the testing, finds that in five years or ten years he has grown as a person. That is the thing you can't stop. And having grown as a person, he is suddenly unhappy in his employment. His employment does not provide him uh, with directional outlets for the growth of his own mental abilities as such. And as these abilities usually have to develop under the pressure of non-economic factors, they are often totally ignored or disregarded and we have a further pro probable cause for intense psychological pressure and early crack-up in Korea. With these tests now being used and having been used for some time, we are in the midst of the worst epidemic of stomatic ulcers and heart trouble in business that we have ever known. This is not due to the fact uh, that the individual was well fit was not well fitted for his job, but that the person was not well fitted to exist as a person. Therefore, his job could not save him from the conflicts with, within himself and also from the weaknesses of fear and anxiety for which he had no adequate correctives. The interpretation of these tests also is highly important 
because it presents another tremendously uh, sensitive and often invalid factor. Namely, that these tests are prepared for the most part from a point of view. They are administered by individuals with points of view. And while the tests are regarded as comparatively impersonal to all involved, it is evident and obvious that the interpretation of them depends upon the transmission of certain ideas from the psychologist to his client or to uh, the person with whom he is working. And this psychologist will not transmit to his candidate ideas contrary to the psychologist's own convictions. He will either pass over lightly things that should be stressed, or he will stress things of little importance. The result is that character analysis by a half a dozen men of a half a dozen different schools will result in a half a dozen different analyses. <coughs> Everyone is honest, and in some major points these tests may have much in common, but the human equation is everywhere present. And this human equation, even as in medicine, 20 doctors, 20 diagnoses. It is not because of dishonesty, it's because of specialization and because of preconception as to value and as to probabilities. These things exist wherever the human being functions. Now the to return then to the problem of finding out about our ten-year-old personality, we come uh, finally to the conclusion that our ten-year-old, in order to be regarded as normal, <coughs> must be, so far as is possible, similar to, even almost identical with, other ten-year-olds, that these other ten-year-olds should be regarded as a group, so that the child is always measured against a group rather than as against an individual, because if you depended upon individual versus individual, you would get nowhere. So a school program is established to take care of the probable estimated requirements of ten-year-olds. Now in this schoolroom, there will be a percentage of children who will not be able to maintain that level. They will not be able to stay with the ten-year-olds. <laughs> and must therefore be regarded as in some way retarded. There are others who in this ten-year-old group will immediately indicate that the requirements of this level not only do not exhaust, but do not satisfy the minds. These children are obviously capable of more mental activity. So they are regarded as precocious, and by various testings to determine the retarded or precocious child, a series of calculations are made in relation to the norm, or the assumed norm. And we come with the conclusion that this ten-year-old body has in it a twelve-year-old mind, or this ten-year-old body has in it a nine-year-old mind. This means, then, that the, the mind and the body 
are not, we might say, adjusted. We do not know this for certain because we are not certain enough of the structure of the body to know whether it is actually geared to this difference or whether the difference is a burden upon that body or a stimulation to it. We only know that in terms of relative value that the body and the mind do not appear to be in close association on measurement basis. So we develop the idea of the precocious child. And we try to determine the nature of that precocity and what we ought to do with it. We have learned, for example, that it is impossible to state with finality any longer that the young genius will become mediocre in later life. Uh, there is a tendency, apparently, for this to happen. But in a great many cases, this so-called loss of genius is merely indicative of the fact that as the child loses its physical interval, it ceases to appear phenomenal to other people. The 20-year-old mind in the, 20, in the 12 year old body appears phenomenal and becomes noteworthy. But the 20 year old mind in the 20 year old body does not appear to be phenomenal. So these geniuses sink back again into the levels of their normal living unless the precocity is maintained. Precocity of this nature is seldom maintained because as the child grows older the specialized faculties move into patterns in which these specializations are recognized the child at 12 who should suddenly appear to be a great potential physicist might be a wonder of the ages but that man at 40, even though he retains a degree of precocity, is in now in association with other experts in the field. Individuality is sacrificed to teamwork and common activity, and the differences are no longer noticeable. The child is no longer outstanding because it has fitted into fields where outstanding attributes are the common requirement. On the other hand, there are indications that unusual precocity may work serious detriment upon the total life of the person. And your so-called precocious child leading to genius in older years is often cursed with an unhappy and even tragic personal existence. Nature did not intend this situation to develop just the way that it did. And because man has not served more wisely in the direction of these procedures, there has been no adequate remedy. Our intelligence testing, then, does settle around the point of the individual's creativity, mental ability, in relation to years. It is assumed, of course, that this is important for another reason. We re regret it very much when we expect children or see others expect children to function beyond their years. We think it's going to be very unfortunate if a small boy is pushed and pressed by ambitious parents, is forced to lose most of the joys of childhood in order to exhibit extraordinary talents. 
we figure this is wrong. On the other hand, we sometimes turn upon the physically mature person, the man of 40, and we require from him what we regard as the appropriate uh, level of action or level of mental activity of a man of 40, only to discover that it is not there. Therefore, this personality, this body, showing the indications of advancing years, becomes the basis of a great hardship upon the mind within it if that mind is not able to function uh, compatibly and in conformity with its chronological year symbolism. Examining the situation as it generally outlines, we have then to try to determine a new kind of norm. And that kind of norm is what may we or what should we reasonably expect of the adult mature human being? What have we a right to believe they should be, and how do we know whether they are capable of this level of action. They can be subjected to testing, and if the break between their chronological age and their psychological age is too great, it can probably be noted. On the other hand, when it is discovered, we are still at a loss as to what to do about it. Because actually, this retarded person has been subjected by nature to every possible inducement to keep abreast of its time pattern. If it has failed to do so under natural inducement, can it be so pressed or so forced by artificial inducement? This brings in another psychological issue. Namely, is there a basic difference between the available mental consciousness of persons? Are we, in terms of mental consciousness, actually born free and equal? Is it only because of some accident or circumstance or incident that the expression of this consciousness is retarded? We can hardly affirm that the availability of mental activity is equal. But this lack of availability may be due to lack of opportunity for the progressive unfoldment of certain mental faculties. Assuming, however, that we are selecting a group of persons from a similar level of opportunity, that they belong to similar cultural patterns, have more or less similar backgrounds in heredity and uh, their environments, though individually specialized, are generally similar. Have we then a right to expect uh, a common measure of maturity, a common measure of uh, psychological age pattern. There seems to be this point that has presented itself, namely the possibility that what we call a lack of mental availability may be due not merely uh, to uh, inadequate mental endowment but to circumstances within conduct or life opportunity 
by which the natural functioning of the mind has been injured, has been retarded, or has been blocked. And psychology recognizes that the mind forced continuously to perform actions which are unsatisfactory to its own nature will become rebellious, will become frustrated, can enter into a state of defeatism and not ever allowed to do what it wants to do will ultimately settle down to mediocrity doing as little as it can in any way and refusing, often adroitly and subtly, to support uh, activities which it does not recognize as valid. <coughs> this situation might then uh, be responsible for a degree of so-called retardedness and the purpose of your aptitude testing is to discover, if possible, uh, where such retarding could be and to assist the individual into fields of activity in which there is the least resistance from his own psychology. If, therefore, he finds at 40 that he is not a success in business, an aptitude test might prove to him that he is in the wrong line of activity, and that therefore he has never received a great deal of energy support, never had his libido back of him, pushing him forward into the things that he might otherwise have succeeded in doing. Lacking internal enthusiasm, he has simply declined to grow. This can happen and uh, perhaps will account for a certain number of instances in which uh, we find low levels of mental creativity in persons where we might expect more. Also, we have to be extremely careful in what we do expect. And here the average person gets into the situation. Each one of us has a complex in himself. A complex concerning the reasonable norms of other people. We see an individual in a certain high office. We say this person must have intelligence. Then we find this same person doing a very foolish thing, and we bitterly denounce them as deceivers, as villains, and claim to be totally disillusioned in them. We are totally disillusioned when other people do not live up to the standards we have established for them. And these standards are nearly always based upon a superficial examination of apparent assets. We say, after all, Jones has reached the point of years when he should know better. Or, there is no fool like an old fool. Or how could an individual who looks so healthy and uh, vital be a coward? It's just not possible. So we begin to condemn and convict these people for actions inconsistent with appearance, particularly with chronological age. One thing that might deceive us and, and uh, really give us something to think about would be to take the same test ourselves. For we always affirm that our state is the normal one. 
When we are 50 years old, we are an outstanding example of what 50 should be. And in relationship to other people, we are the hopeful promise of what 60 should be mentally. We're at least 10 or 15 years ahead of our own chronology in our own estimation. And uh, if we can prove it, it's wonderful. But we cannot always prove it. But we assume that the most foolish thing that we do is consistent with our age pattern, whatever it may be. Whereas the wisest thing that our enemy does is sheer folly. Thus we have a little problem in our own adjustment with people. And one point where it uh, is obvious is that the norm, so-called, is an exceedingly scarce commodity. So we have taken the majority and called it the norm. We have no reason to assume that such is the case. And in other types of testing, we would not accept such calculation. We know that precocity is comparatively rare. We also assume that the truly retarded person is also rare. Therefore, that common expectancy is the norm. But this is only in terms of the way we live here and now, and has nothing to do with a natural norm, which is totally arbitrary as far as our thinking is concerned. Having, therefore, no factual knowledge of norm, we have very little real skill in trying to determine the psychological age of any other person, or making an attempt to require that they live up to it or down to it. We, uh, we just have not sufficient factors. So the norm is usually based upon ourselves. Now it's quite an expensive and difficult problem to go through a very thorough group of tests to determine mental creativity, uh, mental ability to function on a level of pure idea. The most uh, outstanding results now are being gained by the non-intellectual test of mentation. We, uh, we do not seek merely to find the memorizer or the uh, adjusted mental position. Therefore, instead of asking questions, the tendency now is to confront the individual with tasks re requiring originality. It is how he reacts to something he has not done before. It is not enough to ask him to prove that he can multiply number by number. Nor is it sufficient to ask him to keep sequences of numbers in his mind, nor to present him with catch questions, which if he hastens he will not observe. These are not the real problems. The real problem is that every individual in the course of living must face the unlived part of today. He must be able to move from now into the future. And now into the future means that he must face decision that he must also adjust in varying degrees and in varying ways to inevitables, to emergencies, to critical situations, 
and even to the major crisis of all, namely the continuance of things as they are. He must adjust to these things. And to adjust to the new, to meet the challenge of emergency, or to continue consistently in some pattern which requires understanding for its acceptance, the individual must have a certain internal mental resourcefulness, ingenuity, creativity, and that is what has to be tested if we are really going to get anywhere. We want to know not how to make the individual like everyone else. We want to know how to make him like himself and get along amicably with himself. At the same time, not fall into a false egotism or a superiority complex or an inferiority complex. If he decides that he's no good, that is one disaster. If he decides that he's too good, that's another disaster. And somewhere in the middle ground must lie the thing we need. We talk about this norm sometimes in terms of health. One doctor told me not long ago, he says, I have a new definition for health. What is it? He said, a healthy person in our way of life is one who is not very sick. <laughs> He's not sick enough for it to interfere with anything he does or anything that he wants to do. He doesn't hurt anywhere. He is therefore in a comparatively favorable health position. It is no longer possible, actually, to say empirically that anyone is healthy. This situation is also true on your psychological levels. We cannot say that any person is adjusted, but we can say that some persons come nearer to it than others. We can also go back to the oldest pattern for aptitude and adjustment testing that we have, and that is to live with someone. The individual has the rare privilege, not always appreciated, of living with himself. He knows himself as no one else can. He knows many of the things he hopes the analyst will not discover. <laughs> he also has a pretty good understanding of the degree to which he will react under pressure. He therefore is in a position to present himself continuously with examination. This, of course, confronts him with the problem of examination, which is crisis or tension situation. Man, however, unless he becomes neurotic, is not inclined to live continuously in a state of tension. Therefore, he can observe his character traits under tension and also in the normal situation at least normal, so far as his acquaintance with situation is concerned. Thus each person is able to make certain tests upon their own adjustment to their natural age limit. Also to the character maturity which, apart, which is apart from chronological maturity. Looking around us, we have the opportunity to perceive 
persons whom we regard as reasonably well-adjusted. We also have opportunities to see persons whom instinctively we know not to be well-adjusted. We also have what we call great archetypal patterns which bear upon personal conduct in the form of censorship. These archetypal patterns seem to be the basis of psychological age. For without dropping into such small divisions as single years or something of that nature, we do recognize, for example, the growing responsibility of the individual as he passes from childhood to maturity. We know from nature that one of the natural signs of maturity is the acceptance of personal responsibility for action. We know this. We know also that another symptom of maturity is the ability to administer intelligently what one has. That neither the miser nor the spendthrift is, in, is indicating an adequate ma maturity on the level of use or value. We also know that maturity carries with it the biological problem of reproduction. That therefore the normal mature person thinks in terms of home, family, and responsibilities therefore. It is the problem within the maturity level of most persons that uh, potential fatherhood means increasing responsibility towards providence, and that increasing maternal instinct toward motherhood results in constant deepening of those values which make the rearing of children a vital part in the life of the normal woman. These are then basic patterns which archetypally nature bestows. If without good and valid reasons, valid not only to ourselves but to the impartial judgment of experts, unless for good and valid reasons we are unable to meet these patterns, any avoidance of them, any effort to escape their challenge, and any mismanagement of them indicates an interval between chronological and psychological age. The man of 30 who has never become responsible is telling us that he is chronologically 30, psychologically 12. Now, it is all right for a 12-year-old person to live in a 12-year-old body. But when this interval begins to broaden and the person with the 30-year-old body develops a 12-year-old personality, he limits not only his opportunities in life, and his economic security, but he limits his adjustment with life and therefore continues to impoverish himself. Finding that he cannot associate with his own kind in year groups, he must associate only with those of his age group who are approximately of the same mental level as himself. Therefore, he becomes more and more associated with unadjusted, eccentric, uh, infantile persons and creates a world among them and establishes in this world his own norm. 
If therefore he is able to be 12 years old mentally in a world of 11 year olds, he is king. But he is ruling over a very poor empire. <laughs> this situation is commonly present, although perhaps not ex as exaggerated quite to the degree that we mentioned. Up to a year or two in the adult, the age divergence is of slight meaning. We know this in also relationships in marriage. Uh, age differences during the middle years of life, unless they are excessive, have very slight apparent meaning, although they can be meaningful <laughs> as life drifts toward its end and where age differences suddenly become very noticeable again in terms of relationships of energy, vitality, and sensory potential. So that the person with a 30-year-old chronological body who is 29 years old mentally or 31 years old mentally probably has no great situation, and no one else will ever notice the difference. It is only where this retarding becomes marked that we produce the individual who is not able to take care of themselves adequately. We find, for instance, the easy believer who has remained gullible far beyond the period in life in which they should have remained gullible. We find the individual who never escapes from the fairy story that was read to it when it was five years old. Well, a five-year-old reading of fairy story is delightful, or being read to. A seven-year-old is passable. A ten-year-old, we can still say, wonderful to see so much imagination. But when the fifty- or sixty-year-old person tries to live by a fairy story, it is not generally quite so comforting. We begin to wonder seriously. <laughs> also, we know that daydreaming is natural to adolescence, may be occasionally present in maturity, but that large recurrences of it in the older age brackets, not a good sign. Thus we can examine into ourselves to determine, if possible, our own desire to escape into a state of infancy. This escape is away from responsibility. And everyone who is running away from responsibilities that are normally and naturally proper to him is running into childhood, trying to reverse the processes of his own maturing and to escape from the natural burdens which his mental activity has, uh, has brought to him. We can therefore go to work a little bit on ourselves to try to discover how we can develop and improve such characteristics as perhaps are deficient. One of the only certain ways of strengthening any weakness is exercise. And most persons with weaknesses resent even the thought of exercise. Yet it is true that if we find a tendency to evasion, which is childish, then the only possible remedy for us is to begin to be aware of this, aware of the fact that we are nursing within ourselves somewhere a fragment of our own childhood that has refused to grow up. Well, certain parts of that fragment might be delightful, as in the case of the whimsy of Mark Twain. 
But most examples of this fragmentation can be difficult, especially where it causes us to act childishly in a mature situation. Recognizing this tendency, we must by a certain amount of personal effort begin acting maturely. Instead of following the instinct to escape, we must stand our ground and fight it out. After we have done so a half a dozen times or more, we shall discover that we have the potential to do it with. We have simply never allowed ourselves to express this potential. And gradually, in various ways, by the voluntary ex assuming of responsibilities appropriate to our years, we can become accustomed to them if we really want to. If, however, we are not inwardly convinced that this is necessary, and therefore only half-heartedly, make the effort, we might quite well then get ourselves into further psychological difficulty, because we shall be of divided purpose and will permit our new responsibilities merely to exhaust us. We have not grown at all. We have never become creative in the mental sense because creativity in connection with responsibility and problem is the powerful internal visualization of solution. It is giving the individual the instruments spontaneously out of himself whereby he can do better with a situation than has previously been done with that situation so far as he knows. Consequently, the true purpose of the determination of the intelligence quotient is to determine the degree of aptitude that we possess to the solution of the unexpected situation that arises. How much can we draw out of ourselves in terms of common sense? Maturity is the common sense of a, pro of a proper period of years. It is the individual equal to the burden of those years, whatever they may be. And common sense is the instinctive ability to meet a situation in a practical manner. Thus finally, all intelligence aptitude is this availability of a common sense of solution, of answering, of meeting, of solving, of rationalizing a procedure with reasonable thoughtfulness and with sufficient factuality that this procedure is likely to succeed. It cannot be done under confusion or under stress. Therefore, all maturity is victory over stress in the sense of the individual attaining an internal integration. Aptitude, therefore, cannot be told from reading, writing, and arithmetic. It can, however, in school be gained by the intervals of the relationships between children and between children and teachers. It is to be found in the child gradually learning to understand the parent. It is found also for the mature person in his gradual ability to understand the child. It is the ability to bridge intervals without loss of perspective. And in young families, this is a vital issue. 
is this ability uh, to understand outside of ourselves those things that are peculiar, needed, necessary, and proper for other persons. So all the time that we are working with these processes of aptitude checking, what we are really working with is the creativity in the individual. We are seeking, not for the businessman, although we may find him, we're not seeking for the professional man, though we may find him. We are actually, strangely enough, seeking the artist, the musician, the poet, the creative person who, taking the instruments that are available to him, uses them to express himself rather than using them to express themselves. It is not how skillful we use the rapier in fencing. We are not using doing this to reveal the wonders of the sword, but to exhibit the skill of our own coordination. And creativity is this constant revelation of our own creative ability to take something and make something new with it. Therefore, we may definitely say that mental activity should be measured in terms of its creativity. If it is so measured, it then helps us to build a style, a norm, a concept about what is proper for man, who is the projection of mind into matter. We might then gradually come to the realization that the purpose of man is not regimentation. It is not cutting out thousands of paper dolls all alike. It is not that all these bright young children should get up and give precisely the same answer to exactly the same question. This is not the answer. This is not the purpose of it all. The purpose of it all is to produce the individual because the individual is the strongest thing that society can produce. This individual, to be truly strong, must also be adjusted, must be a constructive as well as a creative person. The importance of creativity is expressed in available figure statistics. Namely, that if we removed 25,000 persons from the history of our world, and there are probably that number of persons who are born and die in an hour or two in the life of a nation. And if all the billions and hundreds and thousands of billions of human beings who have ever lived, if 25,000 persons were reduced from that list or removed from it, and others of identical ability did not compensate, assuming that the loss of those persons was the loss of a level of creativity, then we would undoubtedly be faced with the fact that those 25,000 persons, had they not lived, would set back man a million years in his history. All this leadership has been done by named, unnamed, known, or unknown individuals. And the individual is the end product which the mental life of man is seeking to produce. The good individual. The enlightened individual. The person whose contribution is creative. 
Now, it is not assumed that everyone at any time can be creative, but it is assumed that in each individual a degree of creativeness is the indication of his own humanity. This creativeness is revealed by mental action. It is revealed through the mind to the body and through the body to the world. Thus our constant search in testing is for the creative faculties, the faculties by which the person is stronger than the situation. And whenever a situation arises, he creates a solution, learning as he proceeds that the solutions around him can never be completely suitable to him because he is an individual. He rejects in part solutions that are not suitable, recognizing his own need either creatively adapts existing solutions or devises new ones. This person is growing and is strong and is keeping up with the true psychological age norm. And the same is true in older years of the reflective person, who is therefore creating mentally through the assimilation, digestion, and reintegration of knowledge, learning, understanding, and the values that have come to them through life. These consequently constitute some of the problems that arise in the IQ problem. And each person can, to a considerable degree, assist himself. The true high IQ is the creativity level. It is not the person who can answer questions that have already been answered, but the person who can find even a small solution to an unanswered question. And because of this peculiar fact, the IQ test is much like the net of Thales. It will capture little minds but the large ones break through and escape. And the ones who escape often are not voted most likely to succeed, but they have an individuality. They have this intelligence quotient in themselves, this power to project creatively and by their very non-conformity, they fail to pass the approved tests. But they have a non-conformity which can lead them to discovery. And for this reason, many of our greatest leaders have not shown success as aptitude test uh, candidates. They have what nothing else can measure except experience and proof in action, and that is the creative power to penetrate the unknown, transform it rationally and reasonably into new instruments of knowledge, and in this way contribute to the progress of their world. Well, time's up, so we'll have to stop. Next week, we want to talk about the planning of personal environment. Now, some persons by personal environment inhabit usually a suitcase. Some t one time, Mark Twain was walking down the street with a cigar box under his arm, and someone said to him, I didn't know you smoked cigars, Mr. Clemens. He says, I don't. I'm moving. <laughs> now, environment can have a great part on our, in our living. 
But in any environment, though it be limited, though it be small, though it be not luxurious, we can begin to set up relationships, rapports, by means of which environment can help us to be healthier and happier, rather than to detract from our security and peace of mind. So we're going to talk about the environment factors uh, next week. We also have a number of uh, lecture notes uh, from this collection that was turned in to us on uh, past lectures that we have given. We have the uh, lecture dealing with Claude St. Martin, the famous mystic, on the uses and abuses of truth, which is, I think, rather interesting. Also, the four principal virtues as defined and analyzed by the great Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. These lectures and others will perhaps be useful to you. They are lectures that I have given here in the past. We also have a number of books on the table this morning, including some of the novels of Marie Corelli, which have been in considerable demand from a metaphysical and mystical standpoint, and are not too easily secured. Connection with this subject this morning also, we can recommend to you our book, Self-Unfoldment. And for general psychological material dealing with problems from our point of view, we suggest you subscribe to our magazine, Horizon. Also, probably a number of you are aware that we are working rather intensively now with our building fund program. And if there are any of you who are not on our mailing list and have not received the recent circular letter which we sent out on this subject, we hope you will let us have your names and addresses so we can send this letter to you. It explains our problem, tells our needs, and will help you to orient our present building activity. So we thank you very much and hope to see you with us soon. And remember, on Wednesday evening, I'm starting a series of five class lectures at our headquarters dealing with the Atlantis hypothesis and its effect upon the cultures of mankind. Thank you very much.